uh, which in the new institute, which is in Hamburg. And um, we kind of came to an agreement that maybe I should work a little more on this and that I spent some time in this being uh, there in September working more on this project and we're going to have a workshop that's very much focused on the EU uh, and this question of what universities can do. So um, uh, that's exciting, but it's also, like I said, not a topic that I've uh, been able to deal with very easily. Um, uh, and so it is very much a work in progress and I'm kind of hoping I can get, whoops, get some um, responses and thoughts and all of that uh, from you. Uh, so I just kind of have a general introduction that uh, I'll read, his, which comes from the book and some modifications. I've already made more modifications since I sent out the draft, but I'll be doing more. Historically, universities, and more specifically, their academic communities have been uh, key players in promoting uh, of democratic values and national identity in light of a changing global political landscape that includes the rise of new nationalist movements, populist leaders, not accredited governments, how might universities strengthen and expand their role in promoting, and in some cases, preserving democracy. Universities are anchor institutions um, with a breadth and public spaces, with a breadth of influence unique in nation states, but they are also sometimes seen as elite enterprises removed from the realities of society and sometimes blamed for populist as by populists as part of the so-called sinister deep state. And at the same time, there's fault with universities themselves. Um, hmm. Okay, this is the right slide. <laughs> Not sure why that was delayed. Uh, globalization, you know, universities have their faults in this game as well. Globalization and the, net, and the networks of uh, and the networks and collaborations of researchers and students has brought many significant benefits to universities and to society. I think we know that. Uh, we have international colleagues here uh, listening in, so it's all part of our broader global world network, which is great. But in many instances, it also distracted universities from their need to focus on greater engagement with their stakeholders. And I specifically point to the excessive value of ministries and university leaders. And there is a different story about this in the US versus say the EU. So in other parts of the world too. So this is a general observation. Excessive value that ministries and universities leaders in much of the world have placed on global rankings and citation indices. And, and that's part of the story. Universities also gain reputations as increasingly radical, illiberal public spaces, intolerant of dissenting opinions, a view even among moderate liberals, cancel culture, the concept of gender fluid, fluidity, sometimes extremely broad, so-called trigger speech policies. We can argue about anecdotal aspects to it and what is truly problematic. I'm not going to get into that. But universities need to address the issue of academic freedom and, and the public perception. It's part of the story that they have to be, um, universities and their communities need to be conscious of. Well, the intention in this is to observe and analyze the role of universities in promoting democracy globally. My orientation is really towards uh, uh, nation states in the EU and universities in the EU and North America. And that simplifies some things, and I'll get into why, why it does. Um, so in another aspect that, again, very much reflects some of the work, and I'll just say very briefly a few things about it in uh, the book, New Nationalism and, and Universities, looking comparatively at the, this phenomenon and different case studies. Um, the political environment is a significant determinant of the range of activities universities might be engaged in and their limits. And I do discuss there are limits here. What if, how influential are universities in the process of democracy? With a few exceptions, these are the areas of the world that have vibrant liberal democracies, although there's an undertow of, of threat and change. So here are kind of general, three general observations. It actually leads out to be a little bit more than that, <laughs> but I, I'm trying to organize my thoughts about this uh, and uh, looking at the literature, and I'll get into that shortly. Universities have few direct and immediate paths for promoting democracy, broadly defined. 
and that there are limits to their ability to promote democracy and civil society, as I noted. That any significant impact needs to be holistic and focused on meaningful interaction of universities with their societies they serve, serve. The global society is important, but local community, nation state, these are kind of definitions that are really important, I think. And it's a long-term project in, in, in part dependent on the nation state political environment, institutional autonomy, which correlates with the political environment almost exclusively, and we'll get into that, the resources available to a university and the management ability of its academic leadership, autonomy being part of that. But I'll get into that a little bit. And uh, this long-term project aims to include the broad goals of developing an internal culture and organization at universities that seek greater engagement with the public, strategic efforts uh, of engagement focused on university research, teaching, and public, public service mission. These are kind of generic things, but uh, there's structure after this about these, these areas. Efforts to increase the credibility and reputation of universities as sources of factual research and information and exper expertise as legitimate and influential sources of truth and knowledge and seeking a targeted approach. So after all of these more larger scale things that universities need to do, then there are these aspects of targeted uh, approaches to promoting democracy that again, I think are not, uh, they're not earth cha uh, changing events, <laughs> but they're important, uh, including voter participation and supporting democratic institutions, public institutions. Now, I'm not gonna read all of this. I just wanted to kind of clearly put out my intro there and frame some of the things I'm trying to, uh, to explore and think about. And again, reflecting the book, I thought uh, when I first was approached about doing this project, um, you know, I was still thinking very much about some of our, uh, some of the conclusions I came to and with colleagues about, uh, you know, what's going on in the internationalist movements, although, you know, there's also, I don't mean to only talk but although I largely am talking about extreme right wing movements and political parties and these kinds of things and governments, there is a left wing aspect to this too, that the extremists on that side, it's complicated, but what I wanna generally say is that these two political viewpoints are that uh, the national political history and contemporary context, political context is a determinant role of the extent what the universities can do and influence in society. And I just just suppose the difference between a university in Germany versus say China, Turkey, and Russia, where you know universities are very much subject to the political uh, control of the government and uh, more so uh, lately. <laughs> and there's a definite playbook that we see by um, extreme um, autocratic or uh, illiberal democracies, we're seeing that kind of organized effort to control universities because they are sources of potential sedition. And um, this is always a, a major trend we're seeing. It's existed in various ways, but this has a new, new ways of looking at it. And that there's a spectrum looking at that of geopolitical uh, worlds that universities operate in. And so, you know, this is a, a version of what I, very simple, provided in the Neo-Nationalism and Universities book. And uh, in the discourse in, the, in, in this article, I'm trying to say, you know, uh, the range of things that universities can do are really, really significantly influenced by where they sit in this, where the national political uh, world they sit in. And, you know, we're very concerned uh, about uh, uh, everything to the left and a liberal democracies with massive populist movements uh, or a nationalist leading governments. And there's this kind of dividing line of where universities can be really significant players, I think, in promoting democracy or democratic-like institutions. But I'm also including civil liberties like free speech, um, freely elected officials, these kinds of things. So I just was trying to kind of think it out a little bit more and say, well, like maybe there's this dividing line right here where universities really are not significant players in this larger uh, conceptual idea of a civil society. So that, that being said, it was just a kind of a process for me to think it out. Um, and the other viewpoint is that localized strategies and behaviors are really the key aspect to focus on 
um, and you know how organized and what's the internal culture of the institutions and all of that. I've kind of said some of those things already. There is some redundancy here in the, in the article and in my presentation, which reflects again my need to get better at organizing everything. It's going to take me a while, I think, but this is probably why I'm talking to you. So as part of this process, I also try to look at what the literature and those cures are that I can, I'm still looking, <coughs> a number of books. Um, more have come out recently because, you know, we do have a significant uh, turn towards the uh, illiberal democracies in parts of the world and strengthening the autocratic alike regimes um, in countries. <coughs> so there's a lot of stuff coming out, populist kind of, not populist, popular <laughs> types of treat treatments, and almost all of them are really focused on Western democracies, you know, and very nation specific. So lots of things about the United States and how, you know, obviously in reflection of the Trump era and before, but um, it's really been a catalyst for a lot of new work on this area. Uh, mostly are, I don't find are very systematic or organized in how they're thinking about it. They kind of talk about one specific issue Gordon Gee, and I can't remember the other author, have a book out <clears throat> about two years now that basically talks about how much communication and understanding and doing polling and understanding what the public needs are, which I agree with, but it's only kind of like one theme among many. So here's my little list. <coughs> Excuse me of what I found in the literature. And again, it's very much, a lot of it's US centric, uh, frankly. There's, there are things coming out by the Council of Europe and other groups, and I'm, again, I'm trying to monitor and understand this and things, but improve the curriculum so that it teaches democratic values, <coughs> also including diverse viewpoints of people. These are all good, you know, generally. Expand civic efforts, engagement efforts, improve governance to include more stakeholders, voices. Now that one actually is a significant player in the EU and various other parts of the world. In our chapter on Brazil, for example, this is pointed out repeatedly in this lack of stakeholder uh, involvement, and, but in Europe too, and I'll get into why that is. Uh, improving the commun communication skills of academics um, uh, to help improve this public standing of the universities getting to back to that perception, <clears throat> whether it's true or not, we could argue, but this is an area that universities need to be conscious of. The generic concept of fighting disinformation or truth, truth decay, as some people have put it, um, promoting voter participation. So that's a more exacting area. Um, helping academics and students in other parts of the world in some form. And this is a very difficult area. I've been on a couple of, you know, uh, panels on this issue, <clears throat> what you find is that um, there are a lot of programs that are being developed to help academics and students uh, and staff uh, to find homes in other parts of the world for a period. Uh, Canada, for example, has a program specifically for Hong Kong. Of course, it has a strong connection with Vancouver uh, for Hong Kong academics. And we are seeing, we don't know all the data, I don't know all the data, but uh, a flight from Hong Kong uh, of academics and other professionals. Uh, we'll see how long it takes or gets you know, more significant or not. <clears throat> but most of these programs are very short term. There's, I've tried to track them, uh, talking to some colleagues who were uh, running a program at NYU and they're just kind of all over the place. They're short term, there's not a path to citizenship. Um, it, there, it's just, it's good, but it's not, completely um, uh, coherent. So, so these are the major areas that, uh, that yeah, I find in the literature thus far. And again, there are many more are good, but they're kind of always separated. They're not thought in a holistic way. <coughs> so I started thinking, well, how can I think about hol holistically related a little bit to the observations I said before, uh, you know, those, those three observations plus many smaller bullets. Um, and uh, I also thought, I, and I think I'm still struggling a little bit with this. I am struggling a little bit with this. I thought, oh, well, maybe I could think of it in sort of 
in a listing that looks at the internal world of the university, this concept that universities need to be more organized, to create cultures that are more engaged with the society, <clears throat> assuming that's a good thing. And that's kind of the premise of much of this analysis. And then there's an external life. And how do we look at, would that be, <clears throat> that's a way for us to look, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look at uh, this range of things that could be done. <clears throat> so, Sorry, I'm a little hoarse. I'm not going to go through all this list. It's in the paper <coughs> with a few modifications. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you need some hot water? Was that? Would you like some hot water for that? No, it's okay. I, that's okay. I think I'll be okay with that. And so, one is, you know, enrolling a divert. So you can see this is like, you know, is this a direct? Uh, impact on democracy? Is it, is it a short-term project? No, it's a long-term project. But this concept of enrolling a representative uh, of student body uh, at the undergraduate and graduate levels. But, you know, this is varies in that definition of what that means, depending on where you are in the world. And, you know, and the urgency of it is different than, let's say, you know, the Netherlands uh, with a pretty high level of income equality uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, Mississippi or <laughs> Georgia in the United States where there's high levels of inequality and different kinds of racial groups. So it, it's a complex question, but it's depending on where you are. But that conceptual idea is that it's an inclusive pathway uh, and that this has a positive influence on uh, the stability of governments and society. Again, there are areas we could debate about how stability stable it is. I think one thing I'd like to note is that like you look at uh, Ron DeSantis or uh, Florida or Governor of Florida or um, Ted Cruz in, in uh, uh, Texas, these are two significant leaders on the extreme right and the Republican Party. They're both the graduates of Yale and Harvard. So uh, <laughs> there's some complexity to this con conceptual idea, but generally it probably is good. Okay, curriculum and teaching, educating citizens. Again, this gets complex. And this viewpoint, what I'm saying is uh, these are, you know, democratic values, the concepts of, of supporting representative government <clears throat> that is, you know, rel relatively free from uh, government uh, influence. Uh, I'm not saying it quite right, but there are free elections. So, you know, that's, you know, there are, in China, for example, universities are educating citizens or allow they're taking three or four courses now of Xi thought and Mao thought, and the, the, that fits in this, but I'm really talking about a different kind of education that relates to the, the, what we will say is structurally important for the civil society and for a representative government. And that's another, another important element. When we talk about democracies, we're really talking about republics, but we'll get into that, uh, or one can get into that. Service learning is a huge area of growth and importance in the United States. It's only really very nascent in much of Europe, uh, this conceptual idea. And that is, you know, for those who are not familiar with it, which I do have an outline and appendices about it, uh, you know, it's providing course credit or other things in which faculty are providing a program for students to go out and work and learn in hospitals, schools, in uh, community government, uh, these kinds of things. And it plays a big role at uh, major uh, uh, research, public research universities and, and privates to some degree. It varies. Some uh, America's system is so, uh, you know, there are different kinds of institutional types that sort of don't generally exist in other parts of the world. So this is, that's a very important area of this conceptual idea that students are out there one, projecting <clears throat> that universities care about their local communities. They're also learning empathy and knowledge for future careers. Um, so these are generally very positive developments, and, but they need to grow, uh, uh, particularly in Europe, I would say. Uh, this gets back to what universities think they are and what they're supposed to be doing. And that's a cultural aspect that, uh, that we'll, we'll return to to some degree. Uh, academic degree programs with impact on public needs, of course, we could, most institutions are doing things like that. <coughs> Ethics training, seeking diverse faculty. Uh, here's um, 
promoting academic freedom and civil public discourse, easy to say, but this gets back to the issue that I said before about um, cancel culture and other kinds of perceptions about what's going on in universities, which is not completely erroneous. Uh, we do have problems with having diverse political viewpoints being voiced on campus. You know, I'm not sponsoring or hoping we're all looking to have extremists on either side. Uh, we need to, one, uh, one critic has said, universities need to run to the middle. I would say so does the Democratic Party, run to the middle <laughs> so that we're gaining more public support and, uh, and we can relate to the public. So other areas in the internal life, Research is a public good. There's a whole conceptual idea of scholarship for public engagement uh, and can be targeted in issues, uh, but basically it's a general concept that faculty figure out over time. Um, uh, undergraduate research uh, uh, opportunities that relate to, again, society and its needs. Um, uh, this is an outline, which is in the book also, of this conceptual idea of the difference between traditional scholarship and um, and uh, the scholarship of public engagement. And I'll tell you, I'm coming back to this issue in a, in a, in a way that I think is uh, important. Um, and uh, that is the relationship of uh, institutional organization and behaviors. So to encourage public engagement by faculty, which is your key component of, uh, of the institution's ability to do this, uh, in research or public service aspects, these kinds of things. You need to reward it. It has to be integrated into, uh, into hiring and advancement practices. And this does not exist in much of the European Union or a, a lot of the world, which is, uh, there, and there are reasons for it, but um, <clears throat> it is often not a component of advancement or hiring. Uh, and you have to have that integrated if that's going to be something the institution wants to elevate its activities in. And I do provide an appendix because I've written about this and this relates to some topics that I had in a book called uh, The New Flagship University about what are these internal cultures and what are their incentives. So um, these don't exist in many institutions. And so it's this concept of aligning your mission with actually how you incentivize and tell faculty what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, many institutions tell faculty, you need to teach these number of courses and you need to get an X amount of citation uh, indexes in your research. Go, go to it. <laughs> Public service, even professional relationships and roles like being a, an editor of a journal uh, may not get to any credit or any recognition in the advancement process. So that downgrades that kind of activity. I mean, so, okay, so in governance and management, um, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of governance structure you have, what incentives there are uh, to bring in uh, outside stakeholders. I'm not going to get too much more into that. Uh, okay, so external life um, is this other part. And again, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, service learning again, I know uh, extension programs, this concept um, that uh, you have other kinds of programs that are specifically for um, uh, local government or local businesses and more. Um, this was actually an idea that comes from Cambridge uh, in the late 1800s, but it was adapted more thoroughly and more, in a much more systematic way in the United States, supported by federal funds. Um, the Hatch Act in the 1890s. <laughs> so it's a really big player, though, in the relationship of universities with their local communities and their states or their nations. Uh, an example is that the University of California um, uh, itself has around 480,000 uh, participants, individual participants in extension programs. These are just, they could be short term programs, they could be all kinds of things. That far exceeds the total enrollment of full-time students. It's a different constituency. There are a lot of issues related to organization, but it's a huge impact on how the public perceives the institution, uh, the universities, and what their overall impact is in terms of their public mission. So, you know, then there are these kinds of areas like training candidates for public office. Since you have some kind of link 
of, of, your, of your academic programs with the actual needs of professional development and competency by governments and these kinds of things. And then there's the area of policy related research. And if you notice, I have there's not a hierarchy here. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how to organize this to maybe make what is more important than other things. But that gets back to you know also thinking about what's more important in Germany than say in Alabama. So <laughs> uh, these are uh, some complexity to these issues when you're looking at the local uh, uh, political, uh, cultural um, landscape of where the university is. But these are some of these areas, e-democracy, in which research can really have a, a significant and important impact, we hope, in developing um, democracy. So there's a lot of in representative governments and trust in public institutions. There's a lot of work on these this area, and um, you know uh, everything from and one of the problems that we have in the United States is that uh, in big states like California, our representative groups and things are representing you know uh, three hundred thousand people in Congress, and they and I think I've got that wrong, but one constituency. In other words, we don't have enough structure around. Uh, representative government that uh, that works more immediately. So how can you downsize and create structure? But that's those are really complex questions. But these are the kinds of things that universities are engaged in and can be more engaged in trying to support the conceptual idea of a civil society. Um, so other service areas of impact, of course, medical uh, centers are a huge component of the outreach and um, responsibility uh, publicly of institutions. And that adds credibility. There's this concept of what we call in the United States cooperative extension, which is basically having a direct line of providing support to businesses, um, <clears throat> you know, traditionally in agriculture, uh, but it's many other kinds of things. Uh, these are kinds of things like, you know, urban planning, how do we help legal defense programs, um, preserving and interpreting local regional history. So this is kind of a, the box changes. Sometimes you think, oh, it's about, you know, legal defense, how we can, you know, defend people and or help uh, uh, build up public knowledge, but all these other areas like libraries, uh, historical museums, uh, um, theaters and arts, these are also really important components of how universities can and should, depending on the university, what urban setting they have, how many others are doing it, uh, are part of that, uh, um, you know, potential outreach uh, related to um, building up the credibility of institutions, of universities, uh, but also leading down to this overall uh, recognition of uh, the universities need to be engaged in, in supporting local communities. So uh, then there are other kinds of areas of community engagement. As I noted, uh, if you saw, I didn't mention this, but there's been a lot of some advocates and we have one here at uh, the center, Brian Murphy, who would like to see universities be more put more effort into having students and faculty vote at higher percentages and being a more significant voter block. You know, there are a lot of issues related to that, <laughs> but there are programs that are oriented towards that. There's one here at Berkeley, but there's also one that many other the public institutions, Penn State, no, uh, University of Pennsylvania has one called Leads the Vote, which is supposed to about promoting voter participation by the university community and the outside community. And then you put you question, well, who are they targeting? Who are they trying to vote? Uh, whose participation are they trying to drive up? Uh, Michigan, has, University of Michigan has this kind of a program of approach. So these are a number of different things. Uh, management is also really key. I kind of noted that before. It relates to governance and structure of uh, how much are stakeholders involved in some aspects that are appropriate in university management or support uh, in terms of programmatic development, fundraising, uh, these kinds of things. So um, the last, uh, I think it's my last, yeah, on this long list is public relations. So this is an area that's been complained about by many who are writing about universities of democracy, saying that the lack of Organize, organized effort or coherent uh, conversations with the public by academics uh, uh, and university leaders is one problem that we have. And that you learn, need to learn more, need to know more about their stakeholders and the public opinion, 
and then also become more effective. Now, in most public universities in the United States, or all, I would probably say, they have public information and public relations offices that also have relationships with legislators and lawmakers. And so there's a structure around that that doesn't exist in many other institutions um, in Europe or elsewhere. And so that's an interesting component. Do you have a communication strategy? I don't want to be too bureaucratic and administrative about it, but there are things that relate to that. Then I'll just, the only other thing that I'm still trying to think about is there's this role of universities, but there's also the disciplines and faculty and researchers who link because of their field or their interests. And so a, a great one is the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science as, as a public uh, and important, uh, not only having academic journals, but as a, a lobbyist for issues such as climate change and how important it is. So there are other kinds of structural aspects in which academics can be involved in improving and promoting democracy and civil society. So, um, uh, okay. And then, you know, as I had said before, uh, universities should also be thinking about how, how do people view their institutions? Sometimes there's polling done by like Pew or things in the United States, but universities can also be engaged in polling and trying to understand more carefully about how people are observing them, how can they use them and leverage them to get ideas to improve, this kind of thing. That's not happening in virtually anywhere else, I think, but the United States, but that's kind of also a cultural issue. So anomalies and conundrums. So there are many. <laughs> and in the governance and management and autonomy is a good one. One, one reviewer gave of my earlier draft said to me, well, you can have an Ill, you can have a liberal democracy, but institutions that don't have much autonomy. And meaning that they can't, they're restricted more about what they can do. And I did discuss this some. And this is a good example of civil service structure that still pervades much of uh, European higher education, various degrees. You know, the Dutch are supposed to be much more progressive than other parts of Europe. Uh, but that structure, including how you hire an advanced faculty, uh, creates some difficulties in how. Uh, you can, you know, and promote public engagement. And that's a governance issue to some degree um, because, you know, many of these universities in, in Europe have no strong stakeholder uh, board, which is the American corporate model, which is brought from the British, but uh, in an American way. And so they, you know, basically their relationship is with ministry and laws that are passed by their parliament. And that creates structural uh, things that are different than talking about an American university and the levels of autonomy it has and resource reallocation, um, incentives, as I said, for faculty. So there's a lot of complexity in that area. As I said before, and I think this is one of the big things I keep trying to, to point out is this alignment of faculty hiring and advancement with the university's mission. If universities in Europe say, oh, well, we want to have more public engagement. And they'll have rhetoric about it all over the place. But if they don't have the structural uh, part of uh, incentivizing faculty, uh, the main players, but students too, obviously, at a point, but, but uh, then, then you, you've got real problems there. <clears throat> also, I only briefly noted this, but this is an issue. Universities as nonpartisans. So this is a long tradition and, and a, a good one, generally, is that universities aren't political actors or they're not supposed to be. Um, and the leadership should not be. There's a long tradition in the United States of um, particularly in public institutions that the leader that you don't know or they never state whether they're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. And that bleeds down to the conceptual idea that it's not the, what, the tool of any single party. And so you have to think some range like, is it appropriate for a university to try to leverage all the voting uh, here or leverage voting of, say, disadvantaged groups in certain urban areas? Uh, you just have to weigh and think of that. And it's a, a form of protection, universities and their autonomy. So there's issues related to that uh, as to what is an appropriate level, level of activism. And that's a difference between, say, the administration and leadership 
and the difference between the academic freedom of an individual the faculty, then we're talking about different kinds of things. And there's a lot of debate about what is the appropriate level of academic freedom of faculty. And generally the conceptual idea is they have a professional role as, as employees of the university in which they teach and, and do things that relate to their expertise. Um, and then there's the individual uh, as, their, as an individual citizen and their role. And so there's a dividing line supposedly related to that, but I think that is eroded to some degree um, uh, in many American universities. And so anyway, it's a complex issue, um, this concept of nonpartisan. And if I just said before, I won't get into it, but uh, uh, different traditions, this concept of extension and cooperative extension that I noted is somewhat alien <laughs> to much of Europe and other parts of the world, it, it's changing. But if you look at how universities in Europe, for example, discuss what they call the third mission, which in an American viewpoint is, you mean you're just adding it on? It's just, it's just one more little thing you're tacking on <laughs> to your mission. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that idea of large scale extension courses is probably not going to be appropriate. Well, not appropriate, but it's not in the mindset of, say, the University of Heidelberg or other things. So, those are add a lot of co complexity. So then my question would be to the group, I'm gonna just do a couple more things, uh, is um, what, are, what am I missing here in my long list? Um, again, it's kind of a shopping list the way I've structured. I have the external and internal. I could try to um, highlight what's really important in the short term in an EU, remember I'm trying to write this for an EU audience largely, the begin, the, most of this, and what I'm gonna be doing when I go to Hamburg, uh, you know, should I highlight certain things that make sense potentially as new innovative things that should be done in Europe or in Germany? I, I don't know the answer yet to that. I could organize it around, the, if I noted to you, the three uh, kind of general observations I had, but there are problems with that. I'd have to make a matrix probably because there are things that are, don't just fit in one category, obviously. And for what purpose? And this is another area that I think is intriguing. And I, I, I'm not sure yet how to apply it, uh, but it does make a certain amount of sense um, that we should be thinking this way. So this gets back to what is the definition of a democracy uh, and a civil society? And, you know, I do... We can discuss a lot of theoretical conceptual ideas. There's a lot of literature about this over time and the role of universities. Um, so there's a lot of richness and effort, intellectual effort on this um, over time. But I, you can also, I just say, you can dive down and say, well, what is what are the all these indices? They've developed all these indices in the last 25 years, partly because we have more data uh, available. Uh, and uh, there's organizations as to what is really important in a democracy. And the concept being, well, let's look at that and then say, well, how can the universities fit these specific areas of importance? This is a very cheap and quick look at VDAM, which has these as the major uh, areas. And then there's complexity to how they do it. And there's real questions about methodology. It's still an interesting and important <laughs> contribution and we have many indices uh, all over the place but this shows uh, the state of global democracy in 2020. I would say that um, Russia is looking uh, a little darker now <laughs> on this map when it gets updated uh, but you can see uh, if you go back you'll find uh, you know the United States also is having its uh, its issues um, compared to some other parts of the world uh, and also um, I think uh, there's an exaggeration, or perhaps it's a time lapse with Brazil. <laughs> but that's a fight because that's interesting. Right? If Bolsonaro loses, the world could change in Brazil very quickly in its relationship uh, to promoting democracy. But we'll see. So this is another, they have many different aspects, you know, active freedom index. I just wanted to show that because, uh, again, Russia's uh, changed drastically. Uh, be dark blue because it is they're going after academics and people are fleeing and uh, it's uh, a very significant effort to um, 
control universities and communities in Russia. So another one I note in the book in the article is something called the framework for democracy. It's kind of more generalized, um, empowering citizens, social cohesion, responsive policy, fair process, information communication. And then there's an outline of what that means. And, uh, and then uh, one I just recently found, which I should have seen before, uh, is a more complex um, outline of, of points. So all I'm trying to say is, and this is, I, it's, it's worth a look to look at these areas and then say, well, maybe this is one way of organizing and thinking about how universities in li generally liberal democracies, because <laughs> this model fits there, how can they fit into that uh, or be strategic about it? I don't have the answer to that. I'm just trying to think it out. Okay, final observations. Uh, there is a need to define the shared values or versions of democracy and what bro is broad broadly actionable by universities to help them see where uh, their communities uh, can be constructed actors. So relating to this vast series of slides, that internal that the internal and organization of a university and promotion of specific practices can increase the impact of universities on society and on the promotion of democracy. There's some assumptions there. But I think it's uh, conceptually probably sound that there are two spheres of influence for universities as I try to organize them internally and externally, and that's one way of kind of thinking about it with the concept that there are there's an integration of the two areas, of course. But how could we be maybe a little more organized on the external side, which gets to um, uh, um, other points here? While universities. Research and teaching is an important component, perhaps, as I just said, the larger potential impact is in various forms of public engagement that external side, that the range of universities activities can pursue relates directly to their autonomy and the political world they operate in, um, uh, with greater potential impact in nations that already have strong liberal democracies. And then the, I, I hope to kind of think and explore this more as you go down the spectrum towards the liberal democracies and, and what, what range of things can happen, but it's it's pretty uh, coercive uh, to look at what's happening in places like Hungary or Turkey. Um, so uh, that and then finally, that much of that focus here is on the domestic world of universities in promoting democracies already in liberal democracies, uh, two democracies there. So that is that question: what are where where are a Turkey or a Hungary or Poland's shifting a little bit, but I think uh, people don't realize there's still a lot of crazy things going on in Poland relating to academics and freedom of speech, even with due to lining up with NATO. So universities are sources of truth and knowledge that has been extremely useful to society, but it appears obvious that no matter what their national political or economic environment, geography still matters. Uh, that they need to better communicate their value and expand their impact strategically and systematically. And that's what I'm trying to do. Now you can tell me whether I failed or what I should be doing to get better at it. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John.